Hi, in this video I shall be talking about postpartum hemorrhage. Postpartum hemorrhage refers to bleeding occurring after delivery, and this is the leading cause of maternal death worldwide. It is divided into two, we've got primary PPH and secondary PPH. So essentially primary PPH refers to bleeding of more than 500 mils occurring within the first 24 hours after delivery. And this in turn can be divided again into minor and major PPH. Minor PPH referring to a blood loss of 500 to 1000 mils, while major PPH referring to a blood loss of more than 1 liter. An important note to point out over here is that it is virtually impossible to measure the blood loss occurring after delivery, but we tend to assume that if the blood has fallen onto the floor, you can assume that you've got a major PPH on your hands. Secondary PPH refers to bleeding occurring from 24 hours to 2 weeks after delivery. Okay, so let's start by discussing primary PPH first. We can remember the causes of PPH with the four T's. And these are tone, trauma, tissue, and thrombin. And we're going to look at each of these in turn. So, starting off with tone. Uterine natony is the most common cause of primary PPH. 80% of the time, PPH is secondary to uterine natony. Normally, the myometrium contracts, squeezing the placental arteries and clamping them shut, therefore reducing the bleeding. But if the myometrium does not contract sufficiently, the placental arteries continue to bleed, resulting in excessive bleeding and PPH. The uterus will feel soft and boggy in these cases. Now, there are some predisposing risk factors which result in uterine atony. We've got overdistension of the uterus, which occurs in polyhydramnios, and in multiple pregnancy with a twin or triplet pregnancy. Over here, the uterus is distended, making it harder for the myometrium to contract. Next, we have muscle fatigue from delivery, like after a prolonged labor. Bladder overdistension can also interfere with uterine contractions as it pushes against the uterus. Uterine relaxants, such as nifedipine, magnesium sulfate, terbutaline and GTN, also interfere with uterine contractions and result in atony. Okay, so next we've got trauma. So this refers to genital tract injury. So essentially trauma to the perineum, vagina, cervix and also the uterus. So we can have a perineal tear or a cervical tear. There may also be an extension of a cesarean section uterine incision which may bleed profusely. Trauma is more likely to occur with an operative delivery, so a forceps or a ventouse delivery or when delivery is aided by means of an episiotomy. These all increase the risk of trauma to the genital tract. Next, we've got tissue. So this refers to retained products of conception. So essentially, the entire placenta has not been delivered or a placental lobe and is left inside the uterus. This is more likely when the placenta has grown deep within the uterine wall, called a placenta accreta. And this is very difficult to separate from the uterine wall at times. Or else, it may be due to excessive cord traction. As if the cord is pulled on too much, the cord may actually snap. And this may cause problems when delivering the placenta. So basically what happens is that a retained placenta or placental tissue will prevent uterine contractions from occurring. Therefore, resulting in uterine atony and then in PPH. Okay, now lastly, we have thrombin, and this refers to bleeding disorders and problems with coagulation. So essentially, this can be a pre-existing state. So a patient who suffers from a bleeding disorder, such as von Willebrand disease, hemophilia, etc. Or it can be due to disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC. Or it can be secondary to anticoagulants the mother may be taking, such as heparin or warfarin. Great, so those are the causes of primary PPH. Now, there are some things that you can do to prevent PPH from occurring. So, first of all, screening for anemia antenatally has proven to prevent PPH. Anemia delivery is a known risk factor for PPH. So at booking, and then again at 28 weeks gestation, we check the hemoglobin of all pregnant women, so that if they are anemic, we supply them with iron tablets to treat the anemia. 
Next up and more important for the prevention of PPH is active management of the third stage of labor. So this is performed every time. So essentially when the baby is born, we administer a prophylactic dose of uterotonics. So we usually give a bolus of syntometrin, which is a combination of ergometrin and oxytocin. Ergometrin, however, is contraindicated in patients suffering from high blood pressure. So in these patients, we use only syntocinone, which, co which contains only oxytocin. Next, we perform controlled cord traction when delivering the placenta. So essentially, this involves clamping the cord and pulling on it gently while applying counter pressure on the abdomen to deliver the placenta. This is instead of allowing expectant management, where you're just waiting for the placenta to be delivered spontaneously. So here we're kind of hurrying up the process to limit bleeding and help the placenta to be delivered. Great, so next on to the management of primary PPH. So PPH is an obstetric emergency. So when we deal with a patient with PPH, we must treat it as an emergency with ABC, airway, breathing and circulation. We then obtain IV access and take some bloods, including a CBC, because we want to take a look at the patient's current hemoglobin level, a cross match, so that we can give the patient a blood transfusion, and a coagulation screen with an APTT and INR, so that we can assess for any bleeding disorders. So essentially here we're covering one of the four Ts, the thrombin. Um, and if the APTT and INR is deranged, we can involve the hematologists and treat the bleeding disorder appropriately. Okay, good. So next we want to start supplementing with fluids and give a quick bolus of fluids. When blood is available, we can switch to blood. So like we said, the most common cause of primary PPH is tone, is uterine atony. So the first thing we want to do is run up to the patient and start trying to rub up a contraction by performing by manual compression, as we can see in the image over here. This will stimulate the uterus to contract. We also want to insert a catheter and empty the bladder, because like we said, a full bladder may press on the uterus and not allow it to contract properly, so the bladder is emptied. Next, we want to start giving some medications to help the uterus contract. We give uterotonics. We have many choices. We've got syntocinone, which is, like we said, synthetic oxytocin and can be given as a bolus or as an infusion. We have syntometrin, which is synthetic ergometrin plus oxytocin. And we've got carboprost and misoprostol. One important thing to note here, like we said before, is that syntometrin is contraindicated in patients with high blood pressure because it tends to increase blood pressure further. So we give only syntocinone in hypertensive patients. So while we're waiting for the medications to work, we need to start thinking about the other T's. So we perform an examination assessing for any perineal, vaginal or cervical tears, therefore covering our trauma cause. And if we identify any tears, we suture them up. Next, we want to perform a placental examination and ensure that the placenta is complete. If it is not complete or the placenta has not been delivered yet, a manual removal of the placenta is performed. Essentially, what occurs is that a fist is inserted inside the uterus to remove the placenta manually while the patient is properly anesthetized. And this will cover our tissue cause. Great, so back to dealing with the uterine tone, we've used the medications and combinations of multiple medications, but the patient is still bleeding. What next? So we've got some surgical options. And first is uterine balloon tamponade, where we use a ruche balloon, which is inflated inside the uterus with saline, and it presses against the uterine walls, forcing it to contract. If primary PPH is occurring after a caesarean section, we tend to opt for the B-Lynch suture. So essentially the suture is positioned in a way that when it tightens, it compresses the uterus, again forcing it to contract. Other options, if these fail, are uterine artery embolization, and as a last resort, a hysterectomy is performed. Great, so that's basically about it, about primary PPH. So next over here, a short note on secondary PPH. So as we said before, secondary PPH occurs from 24 hours to two weeks after delivery. Causes of secondary PPH include infection or retained products of conception. 
So to investigate, we perform a high vaginal swab to check for any infections and we perform a transvaginal ultrasound to check for any retained products of conception. So essentially, if we identify an infection, we give and cover with antibiotics, while if there are retained products of conception, we perform an ERPC, which is an evacuation of retained products of conception. Great, so that's it about postpartum hemorrhage. I hope that this video was helpful. Thank you.